yesterday on our way back from the airport, um, you clarified something to me that was sort of shocking, because I've always believed, or always have taught, or thought I was taught, that to be canonized meant that you were a saint, and a saint was a very, very special person with special attributes that normal people did not have. You said, no, John, that's not so. Canonization merely means that someone went to heaven. Yes. Now, the present Pope has certainly made a lot of saints. Yes, more than all other popes ever together. Why do you think that, or did someone forget to make the saints and he figured he'd better catch up on it? <laughs> Quite possible. Or does it, get, does it give you more votes? I don't know which. <laughs> um, he needs only one vote. All right. There's one that, 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 uh, that I get a lot of information on that was just made a saint. But, okay, but I take the definition, this man was a very, very holy man, not that he just went to heaven. Yeah. In your definition, he could have repented and uh, had the sacraments and became a saint. Yes. So each of us who attains heaven or purgatory could be called a saint. Am I yes. correct in that uh, statement? Yes and no. <laughs> we always get the yes and no. You don't, know, don't you know the joke about the, the Jesuits? When a guy comes up to a Jesuit and says, uh, Excuse me, Father, are you a Jesuit? Yes. Is it true that the Jesuit always answers a question with a question? Who told you that? <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the misunderstanding comes from the very fact uh, that people very often uh, forget to distinguish. One of the most important lessons that St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us is when he says, Distinguendum est. You have to distinguish. A difference means that the two things are just different. As the English language, look up the uh, American Heritage Dictionary of the English language, which I consider to be the best. Uh, look up the term different. Two things are different. They are not the same. If two things are distinguished, they're basically the same, but under two aspects, they're different. Uh, I'll explain that. That's very important, a distinction. Uh, when you talk about the difference, your answer will always be yes or no, which is what basically what Christ said, the way we should answer. Si, si, no, no. Uh, Yes, yes, no, no. Esto halogos humon, nai, nai, u, u. This should be your word. Yes, yes, or no, no. And uh, so, about talking about difference, uh, is this... Uh, oh, by the way, uh, John, you told me that some people complain about my drinking wine, so let me repeat here. That, that's a nice word, Father, complain. Yes, okay. Well, they get mad at me, so they should be mad at Christ, who certainly didn't drink the disgusting water available in the Holy Land. But anyway... So he drank a lot of wine, he made wine, and he turned himself into wine. So I'm perfectly justified, and I don't even have to be justified. Heretics all, whoever you be, in Tarb or Neem or over the sea, you never shall have good words from me. Caritas non conturbat me. But Catholic men that live upon wine are deep in the water and frank and fine. Wherever I travel, I find it so. Benedicamus, Domino. Uh, what? If I may be allowed well, to uh, quote Hiller Belloc, now may I come back if who I was a defender of faith, uh, according to the Pope. So therefore, it is not that you enjoy wine; it's because really you're following Christ's scriptures with footsteps in his drinking of the wine. Actually, I enjoy wine, oh, and that's don't. the oh. reason why I drink it. But I find myself in good company with that, <laughs> and I do not desire necessarily the company who criticise my, my my drinking wine. They just should not make my judgments and my conferences and my uh, repeating, hopefully, faithfully, always, church doctrine dependent on my holding a glass of wine or a glass of water. But you would say, Father, that, that you do enjoy wine. Very much so. Okay, so it's more than just something that Christ did uh, that you're trying to emulate. I, I repeat, 
I'm not a hypocrite who says that he does the things because Christ did them. I drink wine because I love wine, and I happen to find myself in excellent company there. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm just oh. off my head. I cannot remember the last Pope who didn't drink wine. But, but anyway. The point um, here, Father, is that I get the phone calls, and I, gotta keep, I have to keep on defending you. Uh -huh. Because they all say, you know, we love Father Hess. Yes. But why does he have to drink on camera? For the simple reason that uh, I will not be hypocrite enough to drink wine before the conference, to drink wine after the conference, and just to please some people who obviously don't have their moral standards right on these things, including Christ himself. I mean, they obviously don't have their moral judging of Christ uh, somehow right, because they should really call Christ a sinner. Uh, he drank wine in public. Remember the, the wedding at Cana? He not only drank it, he made it. He right there made it. He didn't even have a license to make wine. But when, we see, when wine. we see pictures of, but, of Christ, yeah. we very seldom see him speaking to the children with a glass of wine in his hand. Uh, true, because we don't see the pictures of Christ the way he was. So If we didn't have the Shroud of Turin, we wouldn't even know what he looked like. <laughs> so the point is, don't tell me not to do what Christ most definitely did. And if I drink wine before the camera, I simply drink wine before the camera because uh, I drink my water in the morning. And this is a conference in the afternoon right now. Right. And if you want to make a conference at 7 in the morning, I will not be drinking wine. I will be drinking my coffee and give you quite, quite boring to answers. Because <laughs> it's just not, as they say in the wonderful south of this country, it ain't my time. I thought okay, that. but see the distinction and the difference. The difference is, this is not blueberry juice, it's red wine. Because blueberry juice is different from red wine. If they, the made, if, if they made wine out of blueberry juice, would it be wine? No. It would be blueberry wine. That's not wine. The common definition of wine throughout the ages, it's also a legal definition, by the way, and an ecclesiastical definition is wine. Uh, the Holy Office, when it still was a Holy Office and not a sacred congregation for the doctrine of the faith that has been lost, uh, the Holy Office said, the matter for Mass is wine. And only in brackets it says, wine made of the grape. Because the word wine is to be understood that way. In Germany, where they make wine out of apples, horrible thought, uh, they, could don't, they don't say, give me a, a glass of wine. They say, uh, give me a glass of apple wine. The evil way. Give me a glass of evil wine. It's apple wine. Throughout history, it has been called wine when it was wine of the grape. The distinction would be, I enjoy drinking this wine, but do I enjoy drinking this wine? Yes and no. Yes, 90%. 10%, it could be a vintage Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley in California, which I would even more enjoy. So there's a distinction. It's the same thing, but there's two aspects. If I had a glass of white wine in my hand right now, or your sweet blush wine, uh, I'd still be drinking it, I'd still be enjoying it, but I would say, on the question, do you enjoy it, I would say, basically yes, but you know, I wish it was red wine. Yes, but So there's a distinction. The it's the same thing, but two aspects. There's no doubt that you, you, you sort of hit me over the head yesterday about the type of wine that you would enjoy. Correct. I usually do that. Because when I told you that I, I drink the blessed wine, as my grandfather made in his basement, you sort of said to me, hey, get me the other wine. So mm -hmm. that's what you're drinking now. Correct. All right. But once again, I, I do have, I read people calling me about your drinking. Yes. And you've clarified that. Thank you. I hope that so. That you are following Christ. No. <laughs> but you like the wine. You, you're still following Christ, but you certainly do like the wine. The point why I'm drinking is, Chesterton said, there's only one legitimate motive to drink wine, because you like it. Right. If you drink wine because it is healthy, you might become dependent on what is so healthy. 
I don't drink it because it is healthy. I do not drink one glass of wine because some self-appointed moral authorities, who will never be Pope, uh, say that one glass might be all right, Father. But don't do it in public. As if I was doing something that you do behind closed doors. Uh, it is patently absurd to put wine drinking in the category of something that you do behind closed doors when it was the Protestants that were responsible for the very fact that we have such things in England as a pub. Pub comes from public. That means you drank your beer in public until 10 or 8 o'clock at night and zip, that was it. And it was the Protestant, and it's Protestant mentality, even when one is a baptized Catholic, it's Protestant mentality to go against this. Why do you have those stupid laws in the state of New York that force you on a weekend to go to a bar in order to drink wine? This is why you have all those driving accidents. Well, don't let me get into all of this. Anybody who tells me that I shouldn't drink, drink wine, at least on that point, I will call him a Protestant right to his face. In the entire tradition of the Catholic Church, nobody ever told me not to drink wine. Moral theology tells me not to drink too much. And what is too much for me is a matter between my confessor and me. As long as you do not see you have a trash piece sitting here, you have no right to complain. And I know you don't anyway. So let's go back to distinction and difference. You have to distinguish. In many points in your life, you will not be able to answer a question with a simple yes or no. Whenever that is the case, we are not faced with a difference, but a distinction. Uh, do you enjoy, or oh, yeah, okay, you might as well ask me. Father, yesterday uh, you took Austrian Airlines flight uh, 078 from Vienna to New York. Did you enjoy that flight? I have to distinguish. Austrian Airlines, I'm not paid by them. Austrian Airlines is an excellent airline, excellent carrier. And it could have been much worse. But who enjoys sitting on the same cramped tight seat for eight hours? I didn't enjoy it. And yet, I immensely enjoyed it because I was coming back to my beloved country, which happens to be the United States of America, not Austria. That's a long story. The point is, di distinguendum is, you have to distinguish. So did you like the flight? Yes and no. Any flight more than one hour is too long for me, <laughs> but then a one hour flight will not get me to the United States. Therefore, I have to distinguish in that answer. I distinguish. Is a saint a man who is in heaven and who was an example on earth and who has the worship of the people, a uh, worship, I'm sorry, uh, uh, um, the uh, adulation, um, veneration, the veneration by the people. I can't say yes to that, I can't say no to that. The actual formula used in canonization says, I, 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 I've not memorized that formula, so. Again, there's always those self-appointed authorities out there who are watching my tapes and say, Father Hess is not quoting this formula correctly. But you can check on the content of what I'm saying. Uh, the formula as such only says that the name named in that formula is among the privileged in heaven. Period. That is what usually is considered the infallible decision by a pope. I will get into this in more detail later on. And then at the same time, uh, we consider a saint, we consider a saint. And mind you, you're not the only one. We all uh, expect a saint to have at least from a certain part, from a certain stage in his life until his death, to have lived what is called a saintly life, and we always expect a saint not only to, ha to have lived a saintly life, but an extraordinarily saintly life. There's many people that, uh, well, not many, but there's always a few people that you and I would know who are living a, a saintly life, and yet, yet they will never be canonized because there's no veneration, and that's the second point. 
So there also must be that sort of veneration. Uh, I was uh, in Rome for 15 years, between 1976 and 1991. In those 15 years that I stayed in Rome, for 10 years, between 1976 and 1986, I would be attending the uh, 5 p.m. Mass and uh, assisting, and later on as a deacon and a priest, be responsible for the Blessed Sacrament, which enabled me, even though that was a Novus Ordo Mass in Latin, but still a Novus Ordo Mass, at least it enabled me to avoid communion in the hand being given while I was there. Uh, that's, I'm not saying to justify myself, I don't have to justi my f justify myself there, I'm just explaining why I stayed. And uh, in those ten years, obviously, I saw all the, uh, the graves of the popes downstairs in St. Peter's, uh, and upstairs every day, basically, or at least once a week. And I realized that very few popes had actually something like the, what you call veneration. Now take Pope jo jo John the Twenty Third. Uh, John the Twenty Third is buried, uh, was buried uh, in one of those niches under the papal altar in a marble box. That's what you would call it—a a plain, rectangular marble box. There was every day hundreds of flowers in front of his grave. There was not a one in front of Paul VI. There was maybe a bunch of uh, withering away roses with Pius XII. There was absolutely nothing with Pius XI, nothing with Benedict XV, and then of course with Pius X it doesn't have to be, it can't be, because he's already upstairs in the altar of St. Pius X, raised, as it is called, to the honors of the altar, being canonized. So, uh, these are indications of veneration. When St. Thomas of Becket died in, uh, whoops, what was it, 1179 or something like that, but anyway, uh, he was canonized a few years later because the moment he was dead and buried, people from all of England came to his grave to pray on his grave, in front of his grave. So that's what he called veneration. They didn't know the details of his life but they had heard the stories of his working miracles. So in those, in those, in those days, it was not just a, a question of taking Amtrak in the United States uh, or Austrian Airlines to Europe or uh, uh, British Railways to go to Canterbury. Uh, they undertook greatest efforts, in, incomparable to what happens today when you travel, uh, greatest efforts to go uh, and pray in front of uh, the, the saint's coffin. So it was very easy for the, for the popes to confirm this veneration by saying, okay, he's a saint. And this is uh, bringing us to hit of the history of canonization now. Before you could possibly understand what the church means when the church says this man has to be, or this uh, woman has to be venerated as a saint, we have to understand what we're talking about. In the earliest centuries, uh, the, the veneration of saints uh, slowly grew. As I said on another occasion, the tradition of the church knows no change, but it knows a deepening, always in the same sense, but a deepening. As you say, uh, a very beautiful word in Italian, un approfondimento. Profondo, profound. Un approfondimento. A deepening of understanding. Same, ho same hole, so to speak. Same thing, but it's deeper and deeper and deeper with centuries passing. So in the beginning, uh, the only saints that were venerated, except, of course, for Our Lord and Our Lady and the Apostles, were the martyrs, because it was quite obvious. Uh, when somebody like uh, Saint Stephen, the proto-martyr, called proto because in Greek the word protos means first, uh, the first martyr, uh, he was an obvious case because he saw, he had a vision, seeing uh, our Lord sitting to the right of uh, God, I mean, Jesus Christ sitting to the right, of God, right hand of God, and uh, the heavens opened before his eyes, and of course the Jews didn't like that, and correspondingly to their own laws, they grabbed stones and stoned the man. 
and uh, all he had to say to that is, uh, don't, uh, help me out with the quotation, when he said, uh, don't, don't, uh, put, uh, don't put this sin on their, uh, uh, what was the quotation? I'm, I'm, I'm lousy on, on Bible quotations, everybody who knows me knows that. Uh, because it just my memory is not as good as some people think. Um, anyway, uh, he, he's, he, he, he asked God to forgive him. That's the whole point. And uh, he, he shed his blood for our Lord. So from the very beginning, the, the martyrs were venerated, and uh, it was actually the competence of the local bishop to approve of that or not. Obviously, whenever you leave something in the hands of bishops, uh, things were bound to go wrong. And they did. There was one case which I recently read about. I, I can't remember it right now, but uh, it's in the Catholic Encyclopedia. You can look it up on the internet, uh, whatever that is. I don't have a computer. Uh, look it up on the internet. Uh, there is uh, such a thing as the Catholic Encyclope Encyclopedia. And you can look up the, uh, the history of the uh, beatifications and canonizations. And it will give you the case of that saint who died in the state of intoxication, something that those people who complain about my wine drinking would immensely enjoy to see me in, and never will. Uh, he died in the state of intoxication, and people thought that he was a martyr. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the bishop said, all right, all right, you may as well venerate him as a martyr. So, <laughs> very obviously, things couldn't go on like that. And, uh, uh, I don't remember now which pope, uh, I think it was in, uh, in 600 or something, uh, the first time that the pope said, uh, the pope assumed the authority for canonizing saints exclusively for himself. And uh, ever since, uh, there could not be a legal veneration of saints unless the Pope agreed. If you take the case of uh, Charles Mann, the Emperor Charles the Great, uh, who was canonized by uh, the Bishop of Aachen, which was his last uh, residence, uh, was canonized by the Bishop of Aachen. It has to be considered a valid con canonization for the simple reason that while uh, the Pope did not canonize him, even though back then it was actually reserved to the Pope to be canonized. No Pope ever contradicted it. Until today, the Diocese of Aachen enjoys a special uh, for, uh, proper for Mass, for the Mass of January 28th, which I celebrate in my private chapel. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, with a special uh, uh, prayers and uh, sequence for Shalman. No pope has, has ever contradicted it, and therefore it has to be considered a legitimate cult. Later on, uh, the, the causes for the saints became more complicated. And then finally, to cut a long story short, uh, Urban VIII, who was pope from uh, 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 1623 until 1640, 1640, wish I could remember, 1644, Pope Urban VIII, uh, finally reserved the right of canonizations, causes for saints, beatification, exclusively to Rome, uh, and uh, meaning that it, it didn't just need Rome's approval, but Rome would do the actual uh, process of canonization. And then uh, one of the most learned of all popes ever, Pope Benedict XIV, Prospero Lambertini from Bologna, who became Archbishop of Bologna and then was elected Pope uh, in the exact mid of the 18th century, but don't ask me for those days, look them up. And uh, Benedict XIV, one of the most erudite Popes ever, wrote 16 volumes, himself, by the way, 16 volumes on uh, De Beatificatione Servorum Dei et De Canonizzatione Beatorum. Of the about the beatification of the servants of God and the canonization of the beatified. In those 16 volumes, he explained on how to approach the whole matter of canonization, 
how to judge uh, the uh, venerated uh, the venerated life, on how to proceed in the examination of his life, on how to proceed in the actual evaluation of his virtues. Was it heroic degree in his virtue, or was he just a, a plain average uh, good Catholic? And then, of course, the most complicated of all things, a thing that I honestly tell you I have great difficulties with, not contradicting the Church in any matter here, uh, the evaluation of miracles. And I will get into this later. And uh, since uh, Pope Benedict XIV, the, uh, the cause for the, con for, for, the for the beatification or the canonization of saints it has, be, has been very well regulated. What usually would happen, did not happen with Pius X, for example, but what usually would happen is that a diocesan bishop would find out, be it that it was pointed out to him, or that he was interested himself, or venerating himself, would find out that a certain person would find a lot of veneration after death. I will go uh, into the example of the Emperor Charles I of Austria, who would have been Charles VII of the Holy Roman Empire, and who was Charles V, King of Hungary. He was the grand nephew of uh, the Emperor Francis Joseph, who reigned from, uh, was born in 1830 and was Emperor between 1848 and November 21st, 1916. But when he died, his own sons had died too. Uh, his grandnephew, Charles, became Emperor, which Pius X had predicted, by the way, at a time when there was no talking about Charles ever becoming Emperor. And he was the last Emperor of Austria and uh, you know all the story of the uh, uh, the last emperor who then was basically kicked out of his own country. Austrians are not always the charming, nice people that you see in Disney movies or movies about Johann Strauss and his waltzes, and uh, died a very unhappy death in Madeira, the island where the wonderful wine comes from. But George Washington drank by the barrel. Just for those who don't like George Washington, there's another reason not to like him. George Washington drank Madeira by the barrel. He was known for that. And another reason why I love him. And uh, so he died in Madeira. Can we um, go back on Washington just a minute? Yeah. Uh, we, 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 is he a saint? Is he a, no, I, I didn't ask if he's a saint. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> but Washington did see the vision of the Blessed Mother. Could be. I don't see a reason why I should doubt it. When today uh, we are facing about uh, 15,834 visionaries running around in the traditional movement, everybody coming up with a different message. Well, I'm, I'm and all they deny is that George Washington had one. Well, we're talking about people who knew Washington said that a beautiful lady appeared to him. But why would they all lie? And well, yes, he could have been the devil. But, but I wanted to bring this up. Also, I heard that he, on his deathbed, bed, became converted to Catholicism. Well, the only reason why I believe that... You do believe it? There's two reasons, actually. I'm sorry. There's two reasons why I believe it. Okay. No, actually, there's three reasons why I believe it. Actually. First of all, everybody who will study closely George Washington's life will find out that he was most definitely a thoroughly honest person. And I warn you, if you say now, <gasps> Father Hess, George Washington was a Mason. So what? So was Leopold Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who died a Catholic with all the sacraments. He was a registered member of the, uh, of the Grand Orient of Salzburg. And George Washington was a registered member of the Grand Lodge of Alexandria, Virginia, according to his own handwritten words in the state archives, in the National Archives in, in, in Washington, he went there twice to perform some ceremonies which are uh, beautifully illustrated in the uh, Fra Francis Tavern in uh, New York, 
in the Masonic Museum upstairs. The restaurant's pretty good, but I'm not paid by them, so I shouldn't go into details. And uh, he participated, according to his own words, he participated twice over in ceremonies that were non-constitutional to the lodges, and then he never went back again. Uh, this is his own handwriting. Maybe he lied, but then uh, that would, it's one of the, one of those things, you, you know that Judge Washington was a man, not because of the legend with the, the cherry tree, but you know that he was a man who, who didn't lie. Everybody can testify to that who has witnessed his life, and many of those who witnessed his life wrote down their, their, their testimony about him. And so uh, he himself was not too interested in his own membership in the lodge, as a matter of fact. And uh, he himself was, uh, he was a practicing Episcopalian until later on in, in life he lost, more and more lost interest in the actual Episcopalian Sunday liturgy because he obviously wasn't satisfied with it. There is witnesses to the fact, written testimony, that in his dining room, most probably the very place where they put the portrait of George Washington now, until about a few decades ago, you would still find the picture of Our Lady he had there. Very characteristic for a Mason, right, to have a picture of Our Lady in the dining room. And uh, there is witnesses to the fact that very much to the astonishment of Masonic ambassadors from France, for example, he would invite people into this room to dine with him and say grace at meals, and there would be the picture of Our Lady. Well, it's not exactly what I call the ritual Masonic life. Also, there's witnesses to his having had a crucifix, not a cross, a crucifix in his bedroom. Yet again, there's those America haters in the traditional movement who will say, nonsense, 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 and they have even less proof for what I say, for, for their statements than for what I say, than I have for what I say. And uh, the very fact that Martha Washington never talked about this apparent con conversion of George is because Martha Washington was from an old Protestant family and a much more important family than the Washingtons used to be before George Washington and probably was very embarrassed by the whole thing. Fact is that if you look at the map, here is Mount Vernon, here is the Potomac, and here was the Jesuit mission. He couldn't have escaped George Washington that every time he sat on the porch of Mount Vernon he was facing a Jesuit building. Also, uh, I've heard from several Jesuits who do not know each other that it is a Jesuit particular to the order, a Jesuit tradition, that George Washington was converted on his deathbed by a Jesuit. Now that's a little bit, at least, a little bit of testimony which those people who deny it do not have. And I go according to probabilities. If I want to be a decent historian, I have to go according to probabilities if I don't have proof. Also, why would Our Lady forget a man who was honest, admittedly honest, all of his life? Of course, there's people again who say that George Washington lied and betrayed this country, and they have a testimony that he is falsified. I will give an example. Uh, in the so-called treaty with uh, Tunisia, there supposedly was a point, I think it was 16, where Judge Washington supposedly said that the con this country, the United States, this here country, is not founded on Christian principles. Absurd statement if you think of the prayer in Congress and the prayer for uh, the United States that George Washington wrote. And they quote a document that wasn't signed by George Washington, but by his successor, John Adams. See, these people are out to destroy other peoples instead of bringing the truth. And uh, instead of praying for George Washington in case he's not a saint, they are out to destroy his memory. Cui bono? To who is good? Well, who profits from this? Who profits from all of this? They, I have, believe they would have a hard time, Father, saying in history that George Washington was Catholic. Yeah, they have a hard time saying that. Well, he wasn't Catholic, but he might have died a Catholic. He might have died a Catholic. Yeah, he might have died a Catholic, and there's quite an indication to that point. Look, as far as John Wayne is concerned, there's written testimony. Pat Stacy, his latest his, his last secretary and his last uh, um, uh, friend, secretary. friend, uh, yes. friend, uh, yes. 
uh, in her biography of uh, uh, My Life with the Duke, she explicitly mentions the fact that a priest was called in on John, on, on John Wayne's deathbed and that he received all the sacraments, all the sacraments on his deathbed. And again, there's people who say nonsense. I mean, uh, who would make it his own hobby to state that nobody converted on his deathbed? How about the Emperor Constantine, who waited until he was on his deathbed to get baptized because he knew that baptism would also take away all the punishment, all the temporal punishment of sin. So the Emperor Constantine it was never forbidden in the church to venerate Constantine as a saint. The, em the Emperor Constantine uh, ex uh, deliberately waited all of his life until he thought he would know that he would die now. Uh, in order to get baptized as late as possible, you know, well, sure <laughs> well, yeah, of course, I, mean, I wouldn't do that, you know, but he did, and he succeeded. So, the mercy of God, thank God, his mercy is not as narrow as the minds of those who contradict me on George Washington. Fortunately, these people have a view, what we call the rifle barrel view. <laughs> All right, we got off the subject now. We got off the. Well, subject. you asked me. I know I did. Okay, now so, going back to canonizations. Right. Um, somebody, George Washington is a good example, and John Wayne is most definitely an example. Somebody might have lived, what, a, a, a thing that George Washington did not do. Somebody might have lived a life less than heroic in his Christian virtues, like John Wayne did, definitely. John Wayne made many mis mistakes in his life, even though he was a profoundly good man, and he was a true, real American, which Congress voted to even. He, had, he received the Medal of Congress saying, John Wayne American, and he deserved it. He did an immense lot of good for the farmers in this country, who happened to be the victims of... of, of uh, what the banks are doing nowadays. I don't want to go into this because I don't want to be sued for nothing, if you know what I mean. It doesn't help the farmers out there if Father Hess is sued by a bank for having uh, uh, committed slander, a libel in that case. Um, with the, uh, the veneration of saints, the important point is that people actually have to display what is called public acts of veneration. That means you take a train, you go there, uh, you venerate and you pray at his grave. Believe it or not, one of the most plausible candidates for actual sanctity, plausible uh, theologically speaking, not historically speaking, because now he is in the, uh, his, his uh, name together with Mussolini and Hitler, which is uh, one of the great injustices of history, in history, but uh, Francisco Franco of Spain has a lot of uh, followers, a lot of veneration, in his grave in Spain. Uh, and uh, the first thing is that there has to be veneration. If nobody venerates the man, the diocese usually would not be interested in uh, any procedure. When we take the example of Charles I, when Charles I uh, died in Madeira, that wonderful island with wonderful wines, uh, people immediately, immediately uh, went to his villa while he was still uh, lying in state in this villa to pray. Not to pray for him, but to pray for his intercession. That is the point. Uh, when he was buried in the, the local uh, cathedral, uh, the cult immediately started. People venerated his grave venerated, uh, I'm sorry, at his grave. And uh, before I left Rome in 1991, I asked a good friend of mine, uh, I can't say where and who, because he's still alive and he might not exactly uh, appreciate my publishing his name here. Mm, but I will mention his name by the time he's dead. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, what happened with the cause of uh, the Emperor Charles I, and he explained a very important thing to me. He said, well, you see, the problem is this. There has been veneration from the very beginning. There has been veneration both in Madeira and in Vienna. 
in Vienna by somebody, you might take an educated guess on who it might have been, but I'm not going to name his name since he's still alive. Uh, any attempt for canonization was sabotaged. Guess who? And uh, in Madeira, the problem was, and there we get to the problem of miracles, which I will have to explain later. The problem in Madeira was that he couldn't get the people to define who had helped them. Because the moment you asked them, said, well, um, obviously you have had your bone cancer cured. We can see this from the x-ray pictures. And obviously we're dealing with a miracle. Uh, how did you get that? Did you say a novena to Charles? And people would say, yes, but I also said my daily rosary for that purpose. See, that's the problem with canonizations. The first problem I mentioned today, the real problem. How would you, how would you distinguish the help of Our Lady from the help of Charles? Our Lady asking her son to work a miracle or the uh, last emperor of Austria asking our Lord to work a miracle. I will come back to that. In, during the history uh, of the church, the veneration of saints was always something obligatory. That means not for every saint, but uh, the veneration of saints as such. Very early in the history of the church, uh, Our Lady and the Apostles were venerated as saints and Masses were said in their honor, not for their, uh, uh, not in their, uh, what do you, what do you intercession? think, for their intercession, not for them. There was back then, there was no, uh, there was no violet chasm, there was all white, but uh, Masses, and no red yet, but Masses were said in honor of those saints. The Roman canon, which is much older than most theologians today admit, the Roman canon uh, is the first list of saints. Petri, Pauli, Andrei, Jacobi, Johannes, uh, outside Mass, I can't memorize, I, I can't quote it by heart, but you know, in the uh, Communicantes and then later on in the Nobis Coca Peccatoribus, in the canon, before and after consecration, you have the list of saints that were venerated in the earliest days. And uh, so uh, the very fact that you have those saints in the canon of Mass means the veneration of saints as such has always been something obligatory in the Church. Now coming back, since we've been distracted by two side questions, Madeira and George Washington, coming back to the actual cause of the canonization, the local bishop noticing veneration will uh, initiate a uh, first examination, asking Rome, of course, for permission, because they might know some things that the bishop doesn't, will uh, start the, the process of information, as it is called. Uh, don't quote me on these details. Look them up in the Catholic Encyclopedia on your website or whatever that is. Uh, but basically, the way is this. The local bishop will start the process of information and will call testimonies. He will also send out officials, appoint a commission of officials that will have to examine the uh, so-called saint's life. So they would, for example, uh, interview the Empress Sida, Charles uh, the first wife, a widow in that case. They would later on, when the children grew up, ask the, the children for their testimony on how their father had been. They would ask the local people in Madeira, how was he? Did you ever hear him, uh, did you ever hear him uh, uh, curse or swear? Did he, uh, did he help you? Was he a man of prayer? Was there anything particular in his virtues? Like St. Pius X who gave away all the money he always had, he ever had. He always gave it away. He always gave it to the poor all of his life. He was in debt all of his life. So hundreds of people would testify to the heroic virtue of charity with St. Pius X. Then they would ask the emperor if he ever lied. They would examine those famous letters that he wrote to his cousin Sixtus, where supposedly he was lying about the state of Austria and Germany in the war, which later on proved to be wrong. 
and he wasn't lying. They would always examine these things. You would get an actual uh, thorough examination of your life if you were a candidate for beatification. Once uh, the diocesan uh, examination is concluded, the whole thing will be handed over to Rome, and in Rome there will be a promoter cause, one who promotes the uh, the beatification of the uh, the saint. Now we come to a critical point. The moment the uh, there are three discussions usually. And uh, the moment the discussions about the sanctity of the man start, there is a person who, I've got uh, one of those printouts here, or pulled a copy of something, uh, there will be a promotor fee day. That means his, uh, his actual job is to defend the faith, the morals, against the man. That's why he's called the devil's advocate, and not very felicitous term for the actual job he has to perform, because what he has to do is he, uh, he has to try to find impediments to beatification. He will have to uh, study carefully whatever has been found out so far, and then he will notice some things, because of course no saint is perfect. You can take the example of St. Philip Neri. He is. When St. Philip Neri found out he was the sort of parish priest at the, uh, at the Chiesa Nuova in Rome, the new church in Rome. And uh, when he found out that some local people called him a saint, he went to the next uh, wine store, got himself drunk, soused, and then uh, <laughs> walking back to the church, not exactly straight line, everybody there could see that the man was stone drunk. And he was hoping that would never call him a saint again. So you can uh, you can vividly imagine that the promoter fee day, the devil's advocate, had a field day with Philip Neri on that point. He would say, "Hey, wait a second, my lord cardinals, you cannot you cannot beatify a man who got himself deliberately drunk, crossed the square in front of Chiesa Nuova, gave scandal to the people who saw him stone drunk." And then uh, beatify the man. Well, rest assured, by the way, he is a saint. And then uh, when he had one of his ecstasies on the altar during Mass, and he would sort of, he would take off and float around uh, uh, the St. Philip Neri, contrary to all those uh, traditional visionaries today, did not enjoy that. They would enjoy that. But he did not. He hated it. Like many of those saints that had some of those uh, gratiae, gratis date, those special given graces of elevation, levitation it's called actually, levitation, uh, St. Philip Neri really didn't like it. So he opened the church doors at night. And at night, uh, believe me, it can get pretty chilly in Rome. So he opened the church doors at night and all the cats came in. <laughs> when St. Philip Neri was saying mass, he'd have the cats running around on the altar. And he said, uh, he admitted to this, he said, well, Lord, now probably you're not going to give me that gift of, of levitation anymore after what I did to you. That man was canonized. So don't, don't tell me anything about my wine drinking, okay? St. Philip Neri got drunk deliberately and he was canonized. I never did that. Once in my life I got drunk, once in my life I got drunk deliberately. I confessed it the next day. That's the difference. St. Philip Neri, I'm not even sure if he ever confessed it, but uh, he did it, and it didn't work, and he still got uh, sanctified, canonized. So the Advocatus Diaboli, the devil's advocate, has to find those little things. Here is two amusing details on St. Pius X. The devil's advocate examined St. Pius X's life, and uh, he found, among other things, he found two faults in his life, which, of course, he immediately brought before the uh, commission and uh, he challenged uh, the beatification by mentioning the fact that St. Pius X, when he celebrated Mass, here's some of those pious people out there who think that the longer you, you need for your Mass, the more pious you are. Well, in that case, St. Pius X was most definitely not a saint because from putting on the Amis until putting off the Amis after Mass, St. Pius X needed 20 minutes for Mass. 
<laughs> face that. Face that, you judges out there. And uh, then the devil's advocate noticed in the detailed descriptions of uh, St. Pius X's life that St. Pius X, born in 1835, when he became a priest in 1858, he uh, first did nine years as a capellanus, as a chaplain, as an uh, assistant parish priest in uh, Tombola. That's up there in the area where he was born. Nine years later, so we are talking about 1867, he became parish priest of Salzano. At the time when he became parish priest, uh, they had a plague in Salzano. One of those things that uh, uh, ever so slightly accelerates your digestive uh, activities, if you know what I mean. And uh, so we are talking about uh, a somewhat odorous disease. And for Pius X, who had very fine senses, all five of them, very fine, uh, very tuned senses, uh, of course he had to give the last rites to uh, these people who were dying in their own uh, waste, so to speak, which is not exactly a happy affair for a sensitive nose. And then he saw the doctor right there calmly smoking a pipe. He asked the doctor, uh, does that help? The doctor, <laughs> and how? Next day, St. Pius X, back then, Giuseppe Sarto, sacerdote e parroco arciprete di Sarzano, most probably for the first, uh, definitely for the first, most probably for the last time in his life, bought a pipe, tobacco, pipe gadget, and matches. I say most probably last time in his life because uh, the moment the, the parishioners found out that their parish priest was smoking. You can take an educated guess on what he got for his birthday, for Easter, and for Christmas. Tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. And he started to smoke the pipe. So uh, he smoked the pipe, and he smoked cigars, and he took the snuff for the rest of his life, until about one and a half years before he died, the doctor told him uh, to please uh, discontinue this activity. St. Pius X did not loudly, like most of those self-appointed saints out there, who criticize me all the time, uh, he did not say, I'll offer it up. Well, he sure offered it up. He, he offered up all the suffering of his life. But he didn't say, I'll offer it up. He complained. The next day, when uh, the, the saintly Cardinal Mary del Val, who was his Secretary of State, came into Pius X's office, and this is in the biography uh, that Mary del Val wrote, Pius X said to Mary del Valle, can you imagine the doctors? They don't leave me anything. Now I can't even smoke anymore. This was the reaction of the great saints. So of course, uh, the Advocatus Diaboli, the devil's advocate, said uh, in the, in the uh, discussion, he said, well, I don't think you could really canonize St. Pius X, uh, you could really canonize Pius X, because in, instead of giving all of his money to the, pu to the poor, uh, he smoked. And then, of course, smoking, you know, it's something like um, hmm, indulging and, uh, hmm, and of course, uh, smoking. Probably back then he would not have been stupid enough to call it a sin, which is common nowadays to call smoking a sin. There's no paper pronouncement on that, but most people out there are their own popes anyway. And uh, he objected. Now, Cardinal Stickler, who is a friend of mine since 1975, and I was his secretary for two years, Cardinal Stickler told me that he, being a member of the, uh, of the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, had the privilege to read the uh, classified volume, which is usually the last volume of the cause for the saint, where you have the objections uh, listed, uh, the objections of the devil's advocate. For many people, the most interesting part of the whole cause. I don't think so, because why would I be interested in all the objections? However, this one, just for the case and for the argument, Cardinal Stickle told me he read that, and he said the reaction of the Cardinals was they all roared in laughter when the devil's advocate said, but smoking is a sin. <laughs> so, you see, um, we're talking about uh, something that basically is very human and very much common sense. The devil's advocate has to make sure if there was 
something really against virtue, really vicious, or really sinful. What do you expect? Christ said that even the, uh, the just will sin seven times a day. So you have to find out not if the saint made mistakes. Saint Ambrosius, church father, said that if I baptize you in the name of Christ, it's valid. Well, it's nonsense. So Saint Ambrosius, father of the church, was wrong. So the saints make mistakes, obviously. I could tell you about some horrible mistakes that some of the so-called greatest saints made in history. Saints make mistakes because only our Lord doesn't make a mistake. Only he. St. Thomas Aquinas was, was not just, as I once said myself, he was not just wrong on three occasions in the Summa Theology. No, 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 no. He was wrong at least a dozen times. Because saints make mistakes, because human beings make mistakes, and saints are human beings. The point of the devil's advocate is to find out if there was something like a public sin, for example. A public sin that would most definitely prevent the man of being, of, of being able to be considered an example. John Paul before, you, before you go on, yes. since you brought St. Thomas Aquinas, oh, yeah. <clears throat> there seems to be an argument that one, someone said that uh, baptism of desire and baptism of blood was not condoned by St. Thomas Aquinas. That's not true. Uh, but I mean, someone said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you and I spoke about it, and you said, well, what happened was they took that out of context, and they used that to say that there is no such thing as baptism of desire or baptism No, no, I know, a case, I know a case where uh, somebody, whom fortunately I've never met, uh, has uh, taken a paragraph of the writings of St. Alphonsus of Liguori, Oh, I'm sorry. And he quoted yes, and he quoted the first half of the paragraph in order to uh, in order to give testimony to his own theory, and he conveniently, because he could hardly have overlooked it, he conveniently left out the second part of the paragraph, where uh, Alphonsus of Liguori clears up his first statement by fully confirming to the teaching of the Church on the uh, what Saint Thomas Aquinas calls. The, uh, in his hierarchy of things, the baptism of the blood, the baptism of fire, and the baptism of water. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas calls it. And St. Thomas Aquinas says the highest form of it is, of course, the baptism of the blood, because when you receive, mostly as an innocent child, when you receive the, uh, the baptism of water, you didn't do anything for it. Your parents even had to carry you there in order to get you baptized by the water and Holy Spirit. But the one who dies, who sheds his blood for our Lord, obviously uh, did uh, in, 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 in many ways a lot more. And then he speaks about the, what St. Thomas calls it, the, uh, the baptism of fire. That means the burning desire to become a member of the church and to join with Christ. Not what is justly thought, uh, the, the vague desire. Something like, oh, I want to be a good person. But that's, that has nothing got to do with the uh, with the desire that is mentioned by St. Thomas Aquinas. So, Father, you're saying that the person who spoke that there is only baptism of water is incorrect. Yes, of course, because the Council of Trent, even in one of its dogmatic canons, says uh, whosoever has not received uh, the baptism of water and Holy Spirit, re out voto. Literal quotation, re, res, the thing itself, or out voto, voto, ablative, ex voto, out of the votum. Votum is not a vague, somewhat uh, not yet uh, precise uh, desire. Votum is the uh, ardent fire, the ardent wish, I want to become a Catholic. So, wow, that's a canon of the Council of Trent. Interpret it however you want. But uh, the Church has never, ever condemned uh, St. Thomas Aquinas on that point. So you cannot call it heresy, what I say. Anybody who says I'm a heretic here, he's a, he's a heretic, because the Church has never said this is heresy. On the contrary, Pius IX pretty well quoted this section 
and Pius X in his catechism uh, gave a very beautiful, I don't have memorized the thing, but gave a very beauty, beautiful definition of what is called, what is to be understood as the desire. But I don't need to uh, I memorize think, uh, let's, let's, go, that because let's go let's back, go back to the canonizations, otherwise right. we'll be sitting here until 3 in the morning. And uh, uh, where were we at the canonizations? Uh, Beatification, well, canonization. Oh yeah, right. Now once uh, the, uh, yeah, the if it happens that the uh, the devil's advocate does not find anything like public scandal, public mortal sin, or so, if the devil's advocate, the, o the only thing he finds is that St. Pius X said Mass in 20 minutes and smoked the pipe, then of course you got the green light to go. Because obviously somebody will not miss heaven because he smokes. The above quoted Benedict XIV, Prospero Lambertini of Bologna, who wrote the 16 volumes on the beatification and canonizations of saints, explicitly forbade his priests, as Bishop of Rome, the Roman, the Roman clergy, he forbade them to criticize anybody in confessional for smoking. He explicitly forbade that. And he himself smoked a cigar all of his life. Benedict XIV may never be canonized, but he's still respected as one of the most learned of all popes. And it would be kind of curious that the very man who writes 16 volumes on sanctity uh, would, would commit that horrible and grave sin of smoking. So, you see, uh, one of the reasons why the Church goes through such an... Uh, did go, uh, the Catholic Church, of course, still does, but the Conciliar Church doesn't. One of the reasons why, the, con why, why the, the Catholic Church goes through such an elaborate procedure in order to establish if somebody is a saint or not is because you got all those self-appointed authorities out there all of those moralists, you know what a moralist is? A moral person is one who keeps the Ten Commandments. A moralist is one who, may, who, who pays attention if you do it or not. Those are the people who don't keep a One Commandment, but they are very, very attentive about your keeping the Ten Commandments. Uh, like we, we so the point uh, is, that, no, the point is that the, uh, uh, they have to go through that elaborate procedure in order to establish if whatever had, could be criticized in that saying was actually a sin or not, or was a public scandal or not, or was, uh, even worse, something that would uh, cause an eventual beatification to be a scandal as such. But you made a distinction. Yes. And the distinction was that the conciliatory church... Conciliar church. Conciliar church. It's certainly not conciliatory. Is no not way. doing what the, the the Catholic Church had done in the past. Mm. No, uh, no, I didn't want to get in, in, into the question which we have uh, discussed on another occasion. How much the Conciliar Church is actually the Catholic Church or not? That's not the point. No, no. The point I'm making well, here is, yeah. uh, and we start this. The, in, in this, this Pope has made some people made people saints. Yes, I understand. Who that. I consider would be would be questionable. Correct. But before you can understand what I offer as an answer right. to that, uh, uh, let's call it a, a riddle. Right. You have to understand uh, how the process of con canonization is going, because you see the uh, the very fact of an elaborate procedure is needed, because. Uh, there will always be people who will be scandalized by things that are not sinful as such, while they would commit they would commit the most horrible sins at the same time. Uh, you have that duplicity of judgment in people. When people judge with two standards, a very lenient standard on themselves, Christ speaks about that in the Gospel, a very lenient standard on themselves and a very harsh standard on everybody else. Uh, the people who curse uh, every day and then they, uh, uh, they uh, chide people who use some average uh, vulgarity, which is not sacrilegious at all. Or uh, the people who have not a spark, not an ounce of charity, not one spark of respect for other people, but they will be scandalized by the vicious sin of Father Hess of drinking wine in front of the camera. 
people who write their own commandments. They're my arch enemies anyway. The 11th, 12th, and the 13th commandment. How dare you? How dare you? And so uh, the church always had to be very careful on how to judge things because the church will always have to be very careful not to foster such a uh, horrible pride in people that they would be able to write up their own commandments. This is one of the reasons why we need the example of a saintly life in order to know what is saintly. In order not to have to rely on our own stupid judgments on what is actually corresponding to sanctity and what is not. Okay, so that was the purpose for the exact and, uh, and, and difficult procedure. The church, until John Paul II, the church uh, attitude towards beatification was, in case of doubt, we don't. That was the attitude. And that was a very healthy attitude. Because as long as the church said, in case of doubt, we do not beatify, you could be reasonably sure, even with St. Philip Neri running around drunk, you could be reasonably sure that uh, whoever, whosoever was proposed as an example of life would be such. Now, since 1978, Paul VI already uh, did some minor changes in the procedure of canonization, but I don't think they vitiated uh, the procedure. Not so with John Paul II. John Paul II, who obviously thinks that uh, as Pope, it is his uh, right uh, to change whatever he wants to change, no matter what. Uh, John Paul II uh, abolished the uh, devil's advocate, which of course is one of the most grotesque absurdities in the uh, so-called history of the church and of the so-called church and uh, that was a political reason the founder of the Opus Dei needed to be canonized now when you talk about the founder of the Opus Dei you talk about the founder of a group which I do not want to go into detail to I just mention a few things that uh, has to be counted among the most powerful groups in church history. In church history, not world history, but church history. Because uh, of the, uh, the policy of the Opus Dei to make sure that uh, the more powerful your position is, the more they want you as a member. Which of course is a very clever approach to power as such, and to money, needless to say. And. Uh, I know from uh, a witness within the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, a witness that I will name publicly once he's dead, uh, that the uh, procedure for getting uh, the founder of the Opus Dei beatified was vitiated. First of all, they uh, tried to beatify a man who was uh, at least dishonest publicly, when he claimed that he had a doctorate in canon law. Until, so, until today, I have not seen, uh, even though there were many requests, I have not seen the written proof to that fact. At the same time, this man, in a time under Pius XII, when uh, the decree of Pius XII, 1949, that the membership in the Communist Party, or the collaboration in the Communist Party, would be under excommunication, the founder of the Opus Dei would accept Spanish or Italian members of the Communist Party into the Opus Dei and when they asked uh, the, uh, uh, the founder, uh, but don't we have to leave the Communist Party then? He would answer, generally he would answer, no, you don't have to. That's public disobedience to a valid and, uh, and validly uh, promulgated decree by Pope uh, Pius XII. By the way, John the Twenty-Third did the exact same thing when he was still Angelo Cardinale Roncalli, Patriarch of Venice. He sided with the Communist Union in Venice against the Italian government. Now, however that might have been under particular circumstances, justified in the sense of a local justice, it cannot be justified on the aspect of obedience to a public papal decree that puts the collaboration with the communists under uh, excommunication. 
So even the, the case of John the Twenty Third has to be uh, considered uh, most probably invalid, also for other reasons which I, which I will mention. And uh, now the worst thing about it is you not only they not only try to uh, canonize, which of course uh, uh, officially has happened uh, last Sunday, but uh, in my eyes is not valid. They try to canonize somebody who, for example in his books was at least very close to heresy, if not a heretic, very close to heresy. Pius X in his Pascendi Dominici Gregis uh, con explicitly condemned the and warned of the doctrine that would constitute the, the laity as the basis of the church. That's in Pascendi Dominici Gregis when he talks about the, the modernists being divided in uh, progressives and conservatives. And then he says that the, the progressives are the ones who uh, want to establish the laity as the foundation or the basis of the church. Well, this is exactly what the founder of the Opus Dei said. And here's another thing you have to uh, uh, see. The, uh, the, personal, the former personal secretary of the Opus Dei, later uh, the successor to uh, José María Escriba de Balaguer, as the uh, leader of the Opus Dei, uh, now being under examination for the causes of the saints, mind you, that's how fast it goes with the Opus Dei, uh, Alvaro del Portillo, in, one, uh, in, the, in his in introduction to the, uh, uh, the Footprints of the Sower, I think that's the English title of the book, I only have it in German, said that uh, Gaudium et Space of Vatican II, which is a blasphemous decree by saying Gaudium Space number 12, that the believers and non-believers unanimously agree that all the activities of human beings are directed towards man as its center and summit. This is a perfect substitution of God with man. And now here, the, uh, the secretary and uh, successor of uh, the founder of the Opus Dei, claims that this was actually, this whole document, Gaudium et Space, was actually the mind of the founder of the Opus Dei. And that again corresponds with his own statements in his own books. So we are dealing with a person who was at least close to heresy, who was publicly disobedient, and who certainly did not have an ounce of humility. Because a humble priest, especially a Spanish priest, if he is humble, would never get, first of all, get rid of the name of his mother. It's a, a long-standing, I don't know exactly how long, but long-standing Spanish and Portuguese tradition that your family name is uh, uh, twofold. You'll always have, first, the name of your mother, and then you have the name of your father. José María Escriba de Balaguer was not born as José María Escriba de Balaguer. He was born as José María Escriba Albas. Escriba was a bravo. B. Bravo. B as in bravo. Escriba. And his second family name was Albas. A-L-B-A-S. Alpha, Lima, Bravo, Alpha, Sierra for those who know how to spell. His name was Escriba Arbas. Arbas was his mother's family name. The first thing he did, this inspired example of humility, he threw out his mother's name and assumed a De Balaguer, which is sort of local nobility. The perfect example of humility. This perfect example of humility later on, in an even greater display of humility, uh, arrogated the title of the Marquis of Peralta for himself. This is all in documents, what I'm saying. Now, how come that a humble Spanish priest, the great, the Grand Master of Humility, founder of the Opus Dei, would request the title of a Marquis for himself, higher than a Count, just between the Count and the Duke? Not John Wayne, but the Duke. I mean, the noble title, Duke. How come he would assume that title, especially in, in such an absurd context, because the Marquis of Peralta is not a hereditary title. 
There was a guy back then in the 16th century who did a favor to the Emperor Charles V. And Charles V said, well, what do you want? Can I do something for you? And the man said, uh, yes, Your Majesty, I'd, I'd love to have uh, a pension so I won't have to work. So uh, Emperor Charles V made him uh, the Marquis de Peralta ad personam, personally, like the English sir. If you're the son of a sir, you're still mister. And the son of the Marquis de Peralta was a mister, a senor. How could the founder of the Opus Dei want or deserve, as a matter of fact, the title of a Marquis who existed once in Spanish history? Why would he want a Marquis that was never his and could not be his, neither from his father's nor his mother's side? Is that what you call a perfect example of humility? Hi, John, you can call me a count from now on. I'm Count Hess to you, okay? Of course he got the title, because by the time, uh, by the time uh, he wanted that title, the competent ministry in Spain was already in the hands of the Opus Dei. That's how things work. And here you have a man canonized for his humility, because there can't be a saint who is not humble, uh, canonized for his humility. So you have the, Mar the, saint, the, the holy uh, Saint Marquis de Peralta. Saint José Marie Escriva de Balaguer, comma, Marquis de Peralta. Humbly born as the uh, José Marie Escriva Arbas, Escriva being a Jewish name, Arbas being a Jewish name, by the way. Escriba, bravo. I spell it for those who are interested, Echo, Sierra. Charlie, Romeo, India, bravo, Alpha. Is the Spanish word for scribe. There are uh, uh, people in this country who still have the German name Schriftgelehrter. Schriftgelehrter means scribe. Escriba means scribe. And the Spanish word albas doesn't mean white. White in Spanish means blanco. Albas, which is uh, derived from the Latin alba, albas, albus. The priest is wearing an alt because it's white. Arbas in American would be spelled Weiss. W E I Z uh, E I S Z. Whiskey, Echo, India, Sierra, Zulu. Weiss. Somebody whose name is Shmuel Weiss, you don't have to guess uh, if he is a Jew or a Gentile. You know it. So his name was actually uh, Josef Maria Schriftgelehrte Weiss or Joseph, Mary, Scribe, Weiss, or Weiss. Why does the man assume a Spanish name? Was he ashamed of being a Jew? A saint was never ashamed of being a Jew. Petrus, Paulus, Andreas, Jacobus, Johannes, the, the twelve apostles were not ashamed of being Jews. Paulus said, I'm a Jew, after his conversion. He was not ashamed of being a Jew. Now, how could someone become a Catholic saint if he was ashamed of being Jewish? When St. Paul said, you have to be a Jew to the Jews, a Greek to the Greeks, and a, La and a Roman to the Romans. And here is a man who was born with a Jewish name, Escriba Albas, and then he's obviously uh, that much ashamed of being Jewish that he changes his name, but he doesn't change his name into some just an Aryan Spanish name. No, he changes his name into uh, some uh, local nobility, and then he claims the Marquis of Peralta. Uh, this man was so obviously, so obviously, totally lacking in humility, that this certainly constitutes a vice in his cause. And now here's the thing. I have evidence that uh, testimony against the man was not admitted in Rome. That reminds me of a certain Yosef Jugashvili. Remember? Yosef Vissarionovich Jugashvili. Oh, he was more famous under the name Stalin. No testimony admitted against him. Yosef Vissarionovich Jugashvili would not have admitted any testimony against him. Any test, any test, uh, any witness against him would be eliminated. So therefore, we have a vitiated cause. 
just to put a 30 seconds on John the 23rd, because John the 23rd is a very easy case. John the 23rd uh, did a contract with Moscow. He had a contract signed with Moscow that Vatican II, the pseudo-council Vatican II, which never was a council, would not speak out on communism. It would not condemn communism, it would not condemn the Soviet Union, and it would not condemn the satellite states. He publicly denied having had this contract. That's a public lie. When John XXIII published his Veterum Sapientia, his encyclical in favor of Latin, the liberal cardinals accused him and said, how dare you? John XXIII said, don't worry, it won't be taken seriously. And it wasn't taken seriously. Call, you call that an honest man and a saint? And John XXIII, I repeat it, when he was Patriarch of Venice, he refused to uh, budge when he uh, supported the Communist Union uh, against the Italian government. Now, what does that make? Aren't canonizations infallible? The day before yes, three days ago, the founder of the Opus Dei, who I say, and I have a lot more to say about this, but uh, we'll have to wait until some witnesses either agree with their testimony being published or uh, until some of the reliable informants have died. However, the question that arises is obviously in a certain sense uh, academic because to us traditional Catholics it's of no real importance if John the Twenty-Third was a, a blessed or a saint or not and even, we are even less interested in that uh, very interesting institute called Opus Dei which uses methods of conversion and mission that are very similar to the Jehovah Witnesses and very similar to, uh, uh, well, uh, they have a lot in common with the Mormons, except that the Mormons are a lot more honest. And uh, as I'm personal witness to, I love Utah, but it uh, doesn't mean I love their religion. But the, Mo the Mormons, are, in comparison to the Opus Dei, the Mormons are very honest people, I tell you that. But that's a, a polemics a, 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 aside from our academic question. Is it possible the Pope makes, that the Pope makes a mistake in canonizing someone? There are three answers. The first answer is, the first possible answer. Not probable, not definite, but possible. The first possible answer is, um, the present Pope is not Pope. If I would uh, testify to that fact, a lot, lot of people in this country would go, "You who finally Father has seized the light." Well, in their eyes, I still don't see the light because I agree with Saint Antonine of Florence that even if a pope preaches heresy, the fact that he's obnoxious in his heresy, which is the only way that he could lose his papacy, the fact that he's obnoxious in his in his uh, heresy would have to be judged. Now, since the pope cannot be judged by anyone. This is Canon 333 in the New Code, and uh, it's an almost identical wording in the Old Code. Since the Pope cannot be judged, it would, be, it would have to be the almost full college of bishops to state that fact. You can imagine, on, you can do your educated guesses on the probability that the present college of bishops would do that. So we cannot establish the fact that the Pope is not Pope, because we are not his judge. We can judge his actions, we can judge his... Uh, words, but we cannot judge his position because that would be judging him. On an occasion that I cannot possibly define, some people say that John the Twenty-Third never was pope, and therefore we haven't had a pope ever since. That, of course, is totally illogical. The uh, the conclave, the papal election, is a uh, an act of administration, and not a dogmatic happening. And I know all the arguments, like the cum ex apostolato, all these uh, bulls and encyclicals, and of course there we are faced with uh, contradictions within church history, because obviously uh, Leo XIII did not believe in the uh, binding value of cum ex apostolato, of cum ex apostolato sofficio, by Paul IV. Paul IV, uh, if you... Uh, have the time for a close study of the personality of Pope Paul IV, you will find 
that he was actually, uh, am I talking about, yes, Paul IV, uh, the man from Naples, Paul IV, that he was a maniac. I mean, he really, seriously, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking about popes of the past. And uh, he, wa he was a maniac. And Leo XIII, in his regulation of the, the papal election, made it pretty clear that this document is not to be taken seriously. So most of the objections uh, against uh, the present pope being pope, most of them, I say, are simply based on, uh, on what you call legalism, a rigid and, uh, like most rigid interpretations when you're not talking about dogma, a rigid interpretation of some canons that are not to be applied anymore. Some other theories say that Paul VI ceased to be Pope the moment he signed uh, religious liberty. That, at least, is a lot more profound as an arg argument, and correspondingly, I've heard it uh, only twice. And then some other people say that we've had Popes until uh, Paul VI was kidnapped, and of course, uh, this is... And then uh, some people say that uh, John Paul II even was Pope until he had the meeting at Assisi. So what happens is that obviously these uh, experts on who is a Pope and who is not a Pope are capable of substituting the Episcopal College's judgment. I don't believe so, and as long as nobody can prove to me, as long as any, anybody can prove to me, as long, I'm sorry, as long as nobody can prove to me, that John Paul II is not Pope, I will formally recognize his papacy, even though there's one thing that one has to understand. First of all, the greatest mistake about the papacy made is to think that the Pope can do everything. The uh, director, director of the French seminary in the 1920s when uh, the, the later Archbishop uh, Marcel Lefebvre would be studying in that seminary, said that uh, now that uh, Pius X has exposed the viciousness of modernism, we are still uh, facing the worst of all possible heresies. The heresy that the Pope can do anything. I have right here a German translation. So what I'm giving you is basically uh, an English translation of the German translation of a Latin original, so indulge with my uh, lacking infallibility of what I'm doing now, uh, I'll give you the gist of it. I swear not to uh, diminish or change or admit any novelty in the tradition that I have found conserved by, uh, preserved by my God-willed predecessors, all the more I will be the faithful disciple, the truly faithful disciple, with all of my burning dedication as the successor and to, and, uh, to keep, with all respect, my, all of my force, all of my uh, efforts, this handed down treasure. This is a very long sentence, so I, I beg your pardon if you lose context. Everything that is in contradiction to the canonical order, whatever it may be, to clean. So he said, he's saying, I swear that I will clean everything, clean out, purify everything that is in contradiction to, to the canonical order. I swear, you always have to remember, it says here, the, the, the picture of what you see is that it says, I swear. Uh, and then he lists what he's going to swear on, what he's going to testify on, what he's going to promise. To, uh, to protect as divine instruction all the holy canons and all the instructions of our popes as if they were divine instruction 
as I'm conscious that uh, I, who has uh, your place only through divine grace, that I, who is uh, the uh, vicar of you, that I will have to justify everything I did at the divine judgment. If I should venture to do anything in another sense or to admit that it is uh, going to be done, then uh, on that terrible day of judgment you will not be very graceful to me, very agnatic, very uh, indulgent with me. This is the, so to speak, the first part of the papal oath of incoronation. So far, the Pope is speaking about his own person. And so the Pope, already being Pope, is not saying we. He says I. The rest here now is the Pope speaking already as Pope. So he says now we. Therefore, we submit to the uh, excommunication in the most stricted banning whosoever would dare be it ourselves or somebody else, to introduce anything new in contradiction to this evangelic tradition, to the purity of the Orthodox faith and the Christian religion, or anybody who would, uh, in his uh, contradictory efforts, try to change things, or to withhold the purity of the faith, or to agree with those who do. I, uh, I understand, if you, uh, you don't understand much of this uh, uh, ad hoc and uh, very lousy translation, but what the Pope actually is saying is that he swears that he's not going to change anything in tradition, that he will accept anything that has been down, handed down from his predecessors, that he's going to uh, cleanse every contradiction to this tradition, that he's going to safeguard the canons and the instructions of the popes, his predecessors therefore, and that he puts, uh, that he submits himself to the most harsh judgment by God if he should do something to the contrary. And then speaking in papal authority, he puts everybody else under the same ban, maybe himself or somebody else. This oath of incoronation is to be found in writing for the first time in church history in 678. I think it was Pope Agatha I. Is Pascal? No, Agatha, I think. And uh, it has been uh, submitted in writing to all the heads of state in Europe, that means the, the uh, emperors of the, Holy, uh, of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, and it has been submitted to the kings of France until... Uh, uh, Boniface VIII, who was Pope until 1303. Boniface VIII, for, for, for political reasons, didn't sign this. However, it's still to be found in the Liber Diurnus, Romanorum Pontificum, that's sort of the diary of the popes. So this thing here has been signed, over 600 years it has been signed by the popes, and ever since then it has never been contradicted. This is what you call church tradition. The Pope has to submit to tradition. Therefore, the Pope cannot do everything. Matter of fact, papal authority, ever since uh, people started to misunderstand the, infall uh, the uh, infallible uh, definition of infall uh, infallibility, most people are under the common error of thinking that the Pope can do everything. If the Pope dyes his hair green, you will do, so, you will do the same. If the Pope says that you must not eat apples, you won't eat apples. Uh, that's not the way it is. The Pope is entirely uh, subject to his predecessors unless you talk about discipline and church government. In matters of faith and moral he's bound, but he's also bound in matters of canonical tradition. Example, the question if a priest may marry or not is certainly a disciplinary question and not a question of uh, faith. And yet, it is uh, 
it has been recommended ever since St. Paul, and it is a law for almost a thousand years now. So, uh, a pope could not, in the future, abolish celibacy because, because it, has, it has become part of what you could call the status ecclesia, the state of the church. In a way, like uh, we have the United States Constitution, which unfortunately is step by step done away with, uh, thanks to the recent presidents and uh, you know what. And uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Constitution of the Church, there are certain things that, while they were only recommended at the beginning, they have become a law long ago, and popes cannot change that. If you think that the Pope can do anything, you will either have to follow him into his heresies, or you will have to declare the see vacant. And since most people have a problem with uh, distinctions and have a problem with complicated answers, they decide for the simple answer, and they will say, for the simplistic answer, I should say, because simple answers usually are true, but they decide for the simplistic answer by saying, oh, we don't have a Pope, and the others say, well, you just got to do what he says. Therefore, I think that this point is not a solution to our question. There is a second possibility of solution, uh, a very, very daring one, very daring one. And uh, I challenge anyone out there who says that Father Hesse said, I challenge anyone to have to retract publicly and even have to go to court, if you claim that what I say now is my conviction. I offer a possibility of solution, I do not say that is the answer. The uh, uh, Church teaches as uh, a certified doctrine, sententia certa, that uh, declarations of sanctity, that means canonizations, are infallible, because in such an important matter, when you talk about somebody being ascribed to the calendar of saints, and very often uh, his uh, veneration being made obligatory, see, that's the difference between beatification. Beatification means you may venerate him. Canonization means very often you must venerate him. And uh, sort of, uh, it, it sounds, of course, highly improbable that the church would be capable of forcing the veneration of somebody who is most definitely not a saint on everybody. One could argue, one could argue that, uh, and that's the reason why I went into such uh, an elaboration to explain the, the, uh, the, the procedure of examining a future saint's life and his miracles. One could argue that since the whole procedure is what you call, uh, it's not uh, evidence and proof, but it's circumstantial proof. You're talking about circumstantial proof. I mentioned the example of Emperor Charles I, when uh, uh, some people in Madeira who were asked if it was actually Novena prayed in honor of the last Austrian emperor, would be the cause of their uh, mir miraculous, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, cure or the miracle that cured the bone cancer, they would say, mm, uh, well, yes, Father, but uh, you see, at the same time, I was, uh, I was saying three rosaries instead of one. And then, of course, he would say, okay, was it Our Lady who, was, who did the intercession, or was it the Emperor? You have circumstantial evidence. Uh, it would be much easier if you faced with uh, something that a whole village, the parish priest uh, publicly announces that the whole village is going to say a novena in the honor of St. Charles, Emperor of Austria, in order to have the child of Mrs. Uh, Schmalzgruber uh, being cured of its bone cancer. And on the ninth day of the novena, the child suddenly is cured. See, this, would be, this is something that you would easily uh, consider as evidence. But mostly things are more complicated. And whenever you face the, uh, the final papal approval that, uh, yes, uh, his life was a saintly life, and uh, very obviously he must have been the one 
whose intercession we have to thank for uh, as regards the two miracles confirmed. We are lastly dealing with circumstantial evidence. Obviously, the Holy Spirit can give his inspiration and his sort of uh, guarantee also for the results of circumstantial evidence. Yet, somebody could argue and say there have been cases when something that had the, sta the status of certified doctrine of Sententia chapter later on was contradicted. I don't know of any case, but there might be an argument. Possibly, one could say, well, we have to face the fact that canonizations are not infallible. I am not saying that. I believe that canonizations are infallible, so I do not accept solution one, and I do not accept solution two. Solution three is, in my eyes, the most understandable. How can a pope, whether he's pope or not, because he doesn't have universal, he has universal power, but he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have, he's not omnipotent. There are many things the Pope has no right to decide about. And there are many things that the Pope will vitiate his own decision if he does it under certain circumstances. Uh, the Pope most definitely uh, sort of revolutionized the procedure for the causes of saints. He abolished the, uh, uh, the, uh, the devil's advocate. He did not admit contrary testimony in some of the cases that he had to deal with. doesn't matter if it was him or some uh, official in the Roman Curia. The Pope is always responsible for everything that happens in the Roman Curia. And uh, so you could say, because of a defective procedure, he cannot come to a decision. And because of his defective procedure, and because uh, of that, that he cannot come to a, a definite uh, answer, he cannot pronounce an infallible judgment, even though it sounds like it. That's another solution. It's a possible solution. I think it's even probable. And yet, I'm still not satisfied with it. It might as well be a combination of both. That on one hand, the way the Pope has changed the, co the, the procedure for examination of the life of the saint, the way the Pope has changed the procedure of discussion will invalidate any attempt to canonize or beatify anyone, in which case even the case of Padre Pio would have to be re-examined. I firmly believe in the validity of the case of Padre Pio, but if the cause is vitiated, the, the, the procedure is vitiated, a future Pope, for the sake of formality, will have to redo the canonization of, uh, or confirm the canonization of Padre Pio, whom, uh, I mean, my, my very good friend and whom I consider a very reliable source of Padre Pio, Father Gruner, said that uh, he most firmly believes in the authenticity of the case of Padre Pio. Doesn't keep me from thinking that a future Pope will have to explicitly, formally confirm that sanctification, the canonization. And then there's another thing. We have said that uh, the, the formula of canonization only means the man is in heaven. It does not mean that he is, has lived a saintly life. Is that possible? Yes, of course it's possible. Remember John Wayne? John Wayne certainly was not the most shining example of a heroic, virtuous, Catholic life. And yet he died with all the sacraments. Do you remember the fact that extreme unction is if there is an act of contrition, extreme unction will confer a plenary indulgence. Doesn't a plenary indulgence mean that you die without temporal punishment? Doesn't that mean that if somebody, even if you lived a less than Catholic life, on his deathbed receives all of the sacraments, including extreme unction, and that very moment dies without a bad thought, let's say he receives extreme unction, he's sorry for his sins because they offended Christ, why would he otherwise want the priest on his deathbed, unless it's for mere speculation? And then he dies without another sin because he keeps praying he's our father, and that moment he dies. Wouldn't he go to heaven without purgatory? Impossible, some people say, because some people think that God's mercy is impossible, obviously. 
But it's quite possible that that happens. In that case, the man could be validly canonized, but he could be validly canonized, yes. He could be validly inscribed, infallibly inscribed, in the list of people who are in heaven. But this is not an act in accordance with the tradition of the church. It's something that you call, in German you call that, a, non, a nicht kirchliche Handlung, a, no, a non-church action, a non-ecclesiastical action, meaning, the term doesn't, in the proper sense, doesn't exist in English, uh, meaning that, yes, the Pope makes an infallible pronouncement, but he does it under circumstances that are most definitely against the interests of the Church, against the tradition of the Church, and against the uh, economy of salvation in the church. Because it's, it's, it's kind of like saying publicly, oh, don't worry about your sins. Just make sure you make an act of contrition before you die. You might not have time for that act of contrition before you die. You run over by a bus. You might be thinking some very vicious thoughts until <laughs> you are gone. No act of contrition here. So that's, of course, that's vicious. Very vicious. And you see, I do not believe in these simplistic, rationalistic answers saying, he makes a mistake, he's not Pope. Or, he makes a mistake, well, in that case I have to say, canonizations are not infallible. These, that's a sort of, it's an argumentation by exclusion. You ain't black, so you're white. What about your being gray? Now nah, you ain't white, so you're black. You ain't black, so you're white. It's not a yes, therefore it's a no. Where's the distinctions? St. Thomas Aquinas says, distinguendum est, distinguendum est, distinguendum est. You should read the Summa Theologiae. Talk about Jesuits answering a question with a question. You should read the Summa Theologiae, where St. Thomas in his answer says, yes, 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 but. I answer with a yes, and then I say, but this has to be considered such and such and such. From another viewpoint, though, you have to remember such and such and such. So under the first circumstance, yes. Under the second, second circumstance, no. This is the, the, the common answer given in the old days by the Holy Office. You ask the Holy Office, may I, under such circumstances, do this and this and this? The Holy Office, Holy Office will answer. If circumstance A is present, yes. If circumstance B is present, no. That's a yes and no answer. Yes and no. You. It's a yes and no answer. And the same is true with most theological solutions. They are simple, yes. But they're not simplistic. They're not black and white. You're not, you're not talking about a theological chessboard. You're talking about a digital picture. You're talking about something that has all shades of color. And still it is simple. I think that the answer is, if somebody who has led a vicious life, but who most probably was torn in between frequenting the sacraments, and as far as the founder of the Opus Dei or John XXIII are concerned, celebrating Mass, administering the sacraments, not giving up, at the same time, unlike a certain Secretary of State in the past, who uh, sent away the priest on his deathbed, receiving the priest on his deathbed, receiving the, uh, the last rites, dying, feeling sorry for his sins, even though he had a somewhat uh, less precise picture about his sins than God will have, and then dying, let's say, as the last one, who just by the skin of his teeth, escapes hell and goes into purgatory and then he's got a whole bunch of bishops and popes and priests who celebrate masses for him. Now are there in plenary indulgences or are there not? Is a plenary indulgence uh, a gallon of gas for a truck or what? Or is a plenary indulgence filling it? Plenary means full. A full indulgence. Plenary indulgence means 
all punishment is taken away. Why wouldn't it be possible that then a man who has led a vicious life but for some reason felt sorry for his sins before he died, he would go to heaven? Yes, but it would be a vicious act to propose him as an example. That's why you will not find the mass of St. Constantine, emperor, in the Roman Missal. Though we all believe that he's in heaven. But he was not exactly the most perfect example on how to reach sanctity. See, the church knows an economy of salvation. Economy of salvation, not in the financial sense, obviously, but economy is a little bit, a somewhat larger and greater and bigger term than uh, the term money. And the economy of salvation means you do not give people their favorite person as saint, but you give them their favorite saint as an example. You show them, okay, not everybody can imitate St. Francis of Assisi. I mean, in my case, forget it. I'll never be like St. Francis of Assisi. So I need some other example. One of my favorite examples is St. Pius X. I'm not up to that standard, but he's a, one of my favorite saints. And he's an example that I, I, I'd look on as an example, as, a, as teaching me how to lead a, the life as a priest. But... To proclaim somebody, just to reduce, to reduce such a beautiful thing as the canonization of a saint to a mere idiotic statement, this man is in heaven, is something that's very typical for the present Pope, but it's not impossible, but very typical. In the conciliar church, usually things are done on that level, and it's a very, very low, it's a sub-level of theology, but it doesn't mean that, this, that because of that, we have no Pope, no infallible beatification or can, uh, canonization. Uh, it just means that we have something that is called vice. We had that before. Alexander VI abused his priestly authority to legitimize his own physical daughter. That is making fun of priesthood. Yet nobody has ever said he wasn't Pope. Nobody has ever even doubted the validity of that legalization of his daughter. It has been accepted in history and by the state in those days. To me, the canonization of the, the founder of the Opus Dei is a worldwide scandal. But what do you expect from a man who kisses the Quran in public? He kisses the holy book that says you may not drink wine. Such a book cannot be holy.